Welcome, Megatron. Who, who said that? I am Unicron. I have summoned you here for a purpose. Nobody summons Megatron! Then it pleases me to be the first. State your business! This is my command. You are to destroy the Autobot Matrix of Leadership. It is the one thing, the only thing, that can stand in my way. Destroy it for me. Why should I? What's in it for me? I will provide you with a new body, and new troops to command. And? And nothing. You belong to me. And these shall be your minions, and this shall be your ship. Now go. Destroy the Autobot Matrix. I will rip open Ultra Magnus and every other Autobot until the Matrix has been destroyed. Autobots, roll out! In the summer of 1986, Transformers The Movie arrived on the big screen, produced on a relatively large budget for an animated movie, at $6 million. It only managed to recoup just over $5.5 million. Now the numbers available for its box office takings only show America, and it was released in other parts of the world, therefore it was deemed a bit of a flop, but its main audience and profit would come from home video, which was its key market. On a critical level, many adult viewers found the film to be totally confusing kids dragged their parents along to the theatres, who had no idea what was going on with the story. The film focused around the events following season 2 of the show, and it bridges that into season 3. Hasbro and the film's producers had no idea how popular Optimus Prime was, and their decision to kill him off in the first 25 minutes was met with anger from the fans. Throughout the film they also kill off 95% of the original lineup, only to introduce a new series of characters to subsequently sell as toys. Kids were leaving the cinema and writing upset letters to Hasbro. But despite these issues, the level of animation and the rock soundtrack blew the show's fans away. The original Transformers show arrived in September of 1984 and ran for four seasons till 1987, totaling 98 episodes. This period is often referred to as Generation 1. In 1984, Hasbro had licensed a couple of toys from Japan and wanted a show to be focused around this toy line, as most kids shows of the 80s were designed with that mentality to sell toys, but some shows work better than others. Luckily for Hasbro, the Transformers proved extremely successful and was one of the most popular toys of the 1980s. 1986 would prove to be a big year for Transformers. Hasbro wanted to produce a movie which I don't think fans were anticipating, introducing a new line of toys, and Transformers the movie went into production in March of 1985. G.I. Joe, another hugely popular toy line by Hasbro, had a movie greenlit as well. When the toy manufacturer had decided to kill off the main character, Duke, once Transformers arrived and the fans reacted badly to the death of Prime, they had to delay G.I. Joe and make quick changes to the outcome of the lead character. With the changes made, Duke is shot in the chest with an arrow and doesn't die but falls into a coma. Don't worry, he will be fine, kids. The movie was originally designed with a full frame aspect ratio, so that's 4x3, and really geared towards TV presentation. But because most theatres project their movies in widescreen or cinema scope, 
the movie had the top and bottom slightly covered up by the aperture plate of the projector to fit the film in the 1851 ratio. I think around 2006 it was finally released on DVD in widescreen. All VHS, Laserdisc and early DVD releases presented the original full frame versions, which actually gives you more picture, but the widescreen ratio certainly makes it feel more cinematic. Fans of the film have often been disappointed with the presentation of all the releases. The colour of Hot Rod is supposed to be red, which is represented properly in the full frame versions, but in the widescreen releases he appears to look more pink. Obviously issues with the colour timing and telecine job were the main culprits. In the Blu-ray release for the UK he appears a little redder, but colour issues are still visible. Transformers the movie includes a lot of the talented voice artists who contributed to the original show such as Peter Cullen and Frank Welker, but they are not actually given top billing in the intro for the US theatrical cut. The movie is well known for its inclusion of well-established stars and new talent. The legendary Orson Welles provides the voice of the planet-munching Unicron. Orson at the time was very unwell, and this would be one of his last films he worked on as he passed away in October of 85. Orson joked that he had no idea what the Transformers were, and often made fun of the character he was playing, but he had an admiration for animated films. His voice at the time was apparently very weak, and the sound engineers had to do a lot of tweaking to make it work. It's not 100% his real voice, but they did do a very good job of saving it, because his voice sounds fantastic throughout, and is the highlight of the film for me. Judd Nelson plays Hot Rod. Judd came to many people's attentions in the classic teen movie The Breakfast Club, and was a big name at the time, giving the movie more market value. Eric Idle provides the voice of Rick Gar, a very odd decision. He is an amazing comedian, but I don't think his voice is best suited for the character design of Wreck. I think they found the right voice for the character in Season 3. Robert Stack plays Ultra Magnus. Magnus takes over as leader of the Autobots when Prime passes away. Robert I remember fondly from Unsolved Mysteries. Last but not least, we have Leonard Nimoy, who plays the new version of Megatron, Galvatron. Leonard has a great deep voice and provides a threatening presence for his character. Leonard returned to the series to play as Sentinel Prime in Dark of the Moon. With the US cut arriving first, it started out with a Superman the Movie style opening sequence, with the credits whooshing on screen, crediting all the big names involved, and had a little bit of narration afterwards to set up the story. Now because many critics complained about the confusing plot, all the cuts outside the USA had a new opening sequence, which took out the opening credits and replaced it with a Star Wars style opening credit crawl. It definitely goes into more detail and sets up the story more coherently, but the amazing Transformers theme tune is pushed into the background as the voiceover takes centre stage. The UK cut removes the one swear word, shit, as Spike looks in horror as Unicron gobbles up one of the moon bases. Also the cut outside the USA adds some quick narration, saying that Optimus Prime will return, a very lazy attempt to avoid any more upset kids. In the future of 2005, Stop the press! This battle has already happened! Unicron, a roaming artificial planet that happily enjoys eating up other worlds, attacks a planet and only two survivors escape. In another part of the galaxy, the evil Decepticons have taken control of the Transformers' homeworld, Cybertron. The heroic Autobots are now using two of Cybertron's moons as staging areas as they prepare to strike against the Decepticons. However, before the battle can commence, they need to obtain more Energon cubes, and an Autobot shuttle is readied for launch to Autobot City, located on Earth. However, the Decepticons have been spying on the Autobots, and they intercept a transmission of their planned trip to Earth. They ambush the shuttle, killing Brawn, Prowl, Ratchet, and Ironhide. On Earth, Daniel Witwicky and Hot Rod fish in a lake near Autobot City, discussing Daniel's loneliness, as his father Spike is on one of the moon bases. Daniel picks up the shuttle's signature as it approaches not knowing the Decepticons have taken it over, and he and Hot Rod race up the mountainside to watch it land. Hot Rod spots the Decepticons and launches a preemptive attack. The Autobots, including Ultra Magnus, Blur, Springer, Receptor and RC, transform Autobot City into a fortress to protect themselves from the incoming attack. As Autobot City gets overrun with Decepticons, Ultra Magnus orders Blaster to radio for assistance from the leader of the Autobots, Optimus Prime. During the battle, Windcharger and Wheeljack are killed, and both sides take many more casualties. The next morning, Optimus and the Dinobots arrive and successfully repel the Decepticon's attack. Optimus confronts the Decepticon leader, Megatron, and the two engage in an epic battle to the death. Hot Rod being a bit of a tit, tries to get involved and Megatron holds him hostage so Prime can't shoot. 
Prime takes a blast to his side. With his last strength, he takes out Megatron and defeats him, but Optimus Prime is mortally wounded. As the Decepticons flee Earth, Starscream wants to take over leadership of the Decepticons and grabs the chance while Megatron is in a bad state. Before his death, Optimus wants Ultra Magnus to assume command of the Autobots and tries to give him the Autobot Matrix of leadership, asserting that the Matrix will one day light the Autobots darkest hour. Ultra Magnus is reluctant at first, saying he is only a soldier, but agrees to carry it with him. Optimus's monitor then flatlines, and he turns grey as he passes away. Try not to cry, viewers. As the Decepticons head back to Cybertron, Astro Train is running low on fuel, so the Decepticons eject some Insecticons. Thundercracker, Skywarp and Megatron are jettisoned out of the ship, and the others argue who should take leadership. The ejected Decepticons encounter Unicron, who offers to give Megatron and the others new bodies on one condition, that they destroy the Autobot Matrix, the only thing that can defeat Unicron. Reluctantly, Megatron agrees, and Unicron transforms him into Galvatron. Composer Vince DiCola, hot off the success of Rocky IV, provides the score to Transformers the movie. The producers approached Vince after being impressed with Rocky IV, and they felt that musical style could work with Transformers. He had a tight budget, composing a lot of the music to storyboards and unfinished footage, but managed to get all the music done on time. Much of the score does sound very similar to Rocky IV. You could argue it sounds like a bit of a cut and paste job. There is certainly a lot of music that is original, but you can clearly hear the comparisons. Vince is very proud of his work on the film, and so he should be. It's a fantastic listen. It's perfectly enjoyable to listen to by itself, and I often play a number of tracks in the background when I'm working. Vince says the film came and went very quickly, and didn't do much for his career at the time, but now he has gained more fans over the years, and people in the industry have come to recognise his contributions to film music. Now everyone I imagine got super pumped when the opening titles came on screen, and the new version of the Transformers theme kicked in, an epic rock ballad by the band Lion. This is probably my favourite track, and I was so gutted it never turned up in the Michael Bay series. Also, Stan Bush's contribution to the soundtrack has to be mentioned. Stan Bush provides the songs The Touch and Dare. The Touch was originally written for the film Cobra, but was never used. Stan even provided a music video, which I discovered recently and I never knew existed. Stan's work on Transformers is probably what he's best known for when it comes to movie soundtracks. He also provided music to Bloodsport and Kickboxer, but I think his work on Transformers is easily his finest. The soundtrack was released at the time on cassette and LP featuring the rock songs and a couple of tracks from Vince's score. This was reissued on CD during the early 90s. Most fans picked up the 20th anniversary CD that came out in 2007. This version includes all 10 tracks from the original soundtrack, plus brand new bonus material provided by Vince DiCola. The bonus material includes three additional score cues and an alternative version of the Transformers theme performed by Stan. In 2013, Intrada released Vince DiCola's complete work for Transformers, featuring over 70 minutes of music, even including his audition piece titled Legacy, which was never used but is a great addition. This score is still available to purchase and is only 20 bucks. Get it while you can. During the 80s, Transformers made its way to the NES or the Famicom in Japan and its add on the disc system. The Famicom version was called Mystery of Convoy, and the disc system was called the Headmasters. Battle of Convoy is a very weak platformer, where you play as Ultra Magnus as you run to the right of the screen, and you can transform into your vehicle disguise. The enemies often appear at random and respawn, making it very frustrating to play. Many reviewers labelled it a shameless tie-in. The disc system version of the Headmasters doesn't allow you to transform, and you can't choose which Autobot to play as. I think it's worse than the previous game. You just go around shooting stuff and trying to avoid being hit. It feels less like a Transformer game. For the 8-bit microcomputers, things don't get any better. Ocean Software published a game on a Spectrum and Commodore 64 that was met with very mixed reviews. A platform game where you run around shooting Decepticons and you can change into your vehicle to travel around the level. You can choose between five Autobots. The C64 version has the theme tune for the show but it runs on the loop, which will drive you mad. For the Commodore 64 only, there was Battle to Save the Earth. This game is very strange. You deploy the Autobots around this basic map to stop the Decepticons from stealing energy. When you get to the locations, you have to shoot down the Decepticons as they attack, 
it runs in real time, so you have to keep on your toes to make sure your Autobots have enough energy and you keep an eye on the Decepticons positions on the map. What made me laugh my arse off that it appears that the Decepticons make a giant hippo at the end. What the hell is going on? To be honest, avoid all these NAF games. They all stink. Only pick them up if you are a collector and you must own everything that is released. Transformers the cartoon wasn't something that I grew up on or had a great affinity for. Now, I was born in 1982. When you get to around six or seven years old, you start to become aware of what's going on around you and what's popular. In the late 80s and early 90s, especially in the UK, I don't think the original Transformers cartoon was on TV anymore. Ninja Turtles was beginning to dominate playground discussions and all my friends were becoming obsessed with them. But other shows I loved watching growing up was He-Man and Thundercats, which were still being repeated. Heck, I even remember the new adventures of He-Man airing on TV and quite enjoyed it at the time. But Transformers wasn't a part of that early morning TV schedule, even in the summer when kids were watching endless hours of cartoon shows, so it's hard for me to pinpoint where I became familiar with the show and the toys. I did come to own a few of the toys, which I got in Christmas in 1990 or 91. I think many of my friends who had owned Transformers got them from their older brothers, who had lost interest in them or like many of us, we would go to car boot sales and pick up loads of toys on the cheap. I grabbed loads of Star Wars toys in the early 90s from car boot sales. Now as I said, I owned a few of the toys. I remember I had Optimus, Megatron and Trypticon without even seeing the cartoon. I think most of us were fascinated by the idea of a robot that transformed into something else. It's like having two toys for the price of one. Later on I was given a VHS tape which contained a couple of episodes of season 3 and I also had a tape on GoBots. I wasn't aware of the animated movie or the changes made to the toy line or even the origins of the Transformers, so I'm no expert on the franchise and didn't see the movie until my early 20s. I found it cheap on DVD for only £3. It was very much a bargain bin movie. However, since the resurgence in popularity of the Transformers franchise, thanks to the Michael Bay movies, the DVD and Blu-ray releases of the 86 movie have become very collectible because they are now out of print. Next year is the 30th anniversary, so I'm sure they will release another edition of the film. When I first watched it, like the critics at the time, I was left a bit confused by its story. It doesn't really give you a strong backstory to the Transformers. It expects you to know who they are and what they do. Hasbro knew the kids would understand what's happening, as they are its key audience. However, I do think they could have made it more accessible for audiences who are new to the series and needed some help to understand the characters. Nowadays when approaching a movie that is based off a show, they tend to start from the beginning and provide a more expanded story on a larger scale, instead of dropping you straight into the action with no explanation whatsoever. The new Transformers that are introduced don't really appeal to me, they don't seem as memorable as the original lineup. Hot Rod is fine, but Ultra Magnus is a bit of a Poundland Optimus Prime. He gets given the Matrix and shortly afterwards gets defeated and destroyed so easily, and Galvatron distills off him. Luckily he gets put back together, but he doesn't do much else. RC is the only female Transformer, but for some reason they never made a toy of her. Why include her then? Obviously it's done to appeal to the female audience, but with Hasbro's whole intention to sell more toys, why ignore her and the whole girl's toy aisle? The problem with the original show and the movie is that there are way too many characters. It's apparent throughout they had large issues giving them all enough screen time. Many characters kind of disappear or just have one line of dialogue. I don't think you see Soundwave being killed off. Jetfire, Warpath and Sea Spray never make an appearance in the movie, but a shit canned for season 3. Further highlighting there are too many characters to deal with. I did chuckle when I saw Decepticon transform into a train. I totally forgot about that character. It would be good to see one based on a menstrual cycle. Do you even know what a menstrual cycle is? Uh, yeah, Brian. It's a good way to get around town, that's what it is. Fans have mentioned it borrows a few things from Star Wars. The opening credit call for the release outside the USA is very much inspired by the 1977 classic. Megatron and Hot Rod use a lightsaber-like weapon. If you listen carefully, they have sampled the sound effect throughout the movie as well. Unicron is basically the Death Star, and RC's head seems modelled on Princess Leia's hairdo. I was a bit confused when Hot Rod ended up underwater on another planet. It feels like a scene is missing where they jump from the spaceship. You see the ship smash into the planet, and they quickly make their escape, but it looks like the ship flies away avoiding the planet so I was a bit baffled when he's suddenly underwater and it felt like they were still on board the ship. 
The movie has definitely gained more fans over time. They love the dark story and themes, for example seeing Megatron with no emotion blast Ironhide in the face as he crawls along the floor to stop him. It felt like a movie for an older audience. The rock soundtrack and amped up animation felt more like a hard-edged version of the show. It gave you large-scale battles that you hadn't seen in the TV show, so it was certainly something more epic. I think fans love the idea of a big screen version of Transformers, but seeing all their favourites being killed off so carelessly and so quickly must have felt like a slap in the face. The death of Prime took all the kids and fans by surprise. Thankfully and sensibly they did bring him back at the end of season 3. The quality of the animation is a bit hit and miss. It goes from very detailed, especially during the moments when Unicorn attacks the planets, then in many other scenes it's very choppy and resembles the quality of the TV show. It's always more detailed throughout than the show and doesn't look too cheap, but the frames of animation drop sharply in many scenes. The animation team were also working on season 3 at the time, so they had to micromanage both productions and a tight schedule, so it's understandable why the quality is inconsistent throughout the movie. I'm fully aware of the huge following this film has. Loads of my supporters grew up on this film and it holds a special place in their heart because they were around at the time when it and the toys were a big deal. They have continued to re-watch the film over the years and still enjoy it to this day. For me there isn't that nostalgic connection because I didn't see it till my 20s. What I love about this film is the amazing synth score, the cheesy rock ballads and its action. It doesn't let up at all. It whips along at a fast pace so it doesn't drag too much. Granted for me I felt the battle with the Sharktikans went on a bit too long. I lost a bit of interest during that stage of the film. But once they commence battle on Unicron it kicks into gear giving you what you want and focuses on the most interesting part of the story. I love all the scenes with Unicron. I think he is a very interesting character but I wanted to know more about him and it's a shame he never made an appearance in the live action films. I will discuss the first Transformers movie by Michael Bay sometime this year, but the less said about the sequels the better. There are some nice moments of humour sprinkled throughout, usually supplied by the dopey Dinobots. In one scene a Dinobot is struggling to get inside a spaceship to escape. Just transform into your normal form and walk on you silly bugger. Can I recommend this movie to viewers who aren't familiar with the Transformers? Yes I can, but perhaps do a bit of research first so you know who's who and what transpired before the events in the film because you will get a bit lost. For fans or haters of the live action films you will find this animated movie far more faithful to the true spirit of Transformers. It doesn't focus on silly human characters but focuses on what the fans loved about the show in the first place, the Transformers themselves. I fear the wounds are fatal. Prime, you can't die! Do not grieve. Soon, I shall be one with the Matrix. Prime? Uh, 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 Ultra Magnus, it, it is to you, old friend. <sighs> I shall pass the matrix of leadership as it was passed to me. But Prime, I'm I'm just a soldier. I I'm not worthy. Uh, nor was I. But one day, an Autobot shall rise from our ranks and use the power of the Matrix to light our darkest hour. Rise, Rodimus Prime. Optimus. No. Now, light our darkest hour. Let this mark the end of the Cybertronian Wars as we march forward to a new age of peace and happiness till all are one! Transformers! 
If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can find more retrospective reviews by clicking on these videos. If you want to watch my upcoming reviews early before they go live on YouTube, you can support me through Patreon. Don't forget the poster designed by my talented artist Peter Bruce, celebrating 100 retrospectives, is still available to purchase. We ship worldwide and postage is affordable.